Thanks, Jim. <coughs> well, and thank you all for coming to my seminar today. I'm going to talk about anatomical and physiological changes of woody tissues caused by fungal colonization. This is my dissertation proposal seminar, and I'm going to talk about two topics. The first one being posterior placenta in brown rot wood decay, and the second topic being ceratocystis species that are associated with rapid ohia death in Hawaii. For both of these, I'm going to provide some context. I'm going to uh, talk about my goals and hypotheses, and I will talk about the methodology that I intend to use to tackle these research problems. So let's get started with the first topic, posterior placenta and brown rot wood decay. Postia placenta is a model brown rot fungus. It's a basidiomycete polypore that in the wild you can often see on decaying logs and stumps. It has a resupinate growth form and almost looks like a crust as you can see in these pictures here. I spend a fair amount of time in the woods looking for mushrooms and I've never actually come across this. Um, however, Postia placenta has become a laboratory workhorse fungus and it's widely used. Its uh, genome sequence has been available since 2009. <clears throat> so again, Postia is a model brown rot fungus. Characteristically, we can say that the brown rot fungi will uh, selectively extract cellulose and hemicellulose out of woody biomass, um, circumvented lignin in the process. So often, as brown rot proceeds, um, you will see wood that has a brownish discoloration, as you can see in the picture here, which is due to the lignin residues that are left behind as the brown rot process um, finishes. So specifically, we can say that lignin does not get degraded in the process. However, um, at a molecular level, we can say that lignin does, in fact, get modified in the process. Now before I move on, I want to take a look to, at the um, layers of the plant cell walls, um, just to remind everybody what uh, plant anatomy that is important here looks like. Um, so plant cells are joined together tightly by the middle lamella, and you can see it here in the dark coloration, kind of brownish, blackish. This is a lignin ridge um, matrix that holds its cells together. Now, moving in from the outside towards the interior of the cell, we have a thin primary plant cell wall over here, followed by the secondary plant cell wall, which has quite a large diameter and has distinct sublayers that I will talk about in the later slides, followed by a very thin plasma membrane, um, which will then lead into the interior or the lumen of the cell. No polymers that we can see in the primary plant cell wall would be cellulose, pectin, and hemicellulose. Those that you can see in the secondary plant wall are cellulose lignin and hemicellulose. Now, looking at um, the stereotypical drawing here, it makes sense that we can find our brown rot fungi in the secondary plant cell wall, which is much thicker than the other layers and it has cellulose and hemicellulose in it, which are the components that brown rot fungi will target during metabolism. <coughs> so we can subdivide the secondary plant cell wall into three distinct layers. There's the S1, the S2, and the S3 layer. Um, I provided a transmission electron micrograph here, and you can see that the S1 layer um, is closest to the middle lamella, right here. And then we have our S2 layer, which is quite large, spans most of the secondary plant cell wall. And then closest to the lumen of the cell, we have our S3 layer. Now, characteristically for brown rot fungi, we can say that the brown rotters rapidly degrade the S2 layer of the plant cell wall. Moreover, this will lead to uh, rapid strength loss in wood. Now, why should we study brown rot fungi? I wanted to give you a bit of uh, context here. So if you think about that cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on Earth, it makes sense um, that perhaps we could focus on cellulosic structures as a source of energy production, specifically as a source of biofuels. 
Um, for the last two decades, the US Department um, of Energy has provided some research money to focus on cellulosic biomass um, as a source of energy and specifically as a way to make um, bioethanols. So this research has different foci. Um, some research is actually targeted, uh, targeting crop residues such as corn stovers after the harvest um, to use those to generate bioethanols. Others may focus on cellulose rich crops such as switchgrass. But if we remember that up to 50% of woody biomass consists of cellulose, it is really sensible to focus research efforts that are targeted in biofuels on woody tissues. What we know about brown rot decay today is that it proceeds as a two-step mechanism. We can uh, identify a first non-enzymatic step, um, a type of a pretreatment, and secondly, we can identify an enzymatic release of carbohydrates. Now, in the pretreatment, we will find um, reactive hydroxyl radicals that are generated during the Fenton reaction, which will then lead to an oxidative disruption um, as a type of pretreatment that you could think about as a way to loosen down or loosen up the individual layers of the secondary cell wall. Now, this is followed by an actual fungal release of enzymes, um, cellulases, which will then attack and cause hydrolytic disruption and metabolism of the complex carbohydrate, carbohydrates that are present. <coughs> now, uh, Jonathan Schilling's group in the BBE here on campus recently um, published a transcriptome study that corroborated the two-step two mechanisms that we know about brown rot decay. So specifically, Schilling's group uh, and the transcriptome study um, concluded that cellulases during brown rot decay, specifically with Postia placenta, are upregulated in mid-stage and later stage decay. Let's take a look at figure four from the paper. Um, so here on the y-axis we see transcriptional activity. On the x-axis we are looking at decreasing distance from the hyphal front. So starting on the right here, uh, looking at this uh, reddish area, we are looking at the hyphal front, which you can think about as the interface between healthy wood and an advancing growing mycelium. And it turns out that transcriptional activity here shows that we have very little or no enzymatic saccharification taking place. Saccharification meaning that we have our complex carbohydrate chains broken down into simpler subunits via enzymes. So in the red area, we really find our oxidative pretreatments here. As we move to the left and away from the hyphal front, we see that transcriptional activity in blue here is spiking. So this refers to mid-stage and later stage decay. So again, this shows us that we have cellulase and enzymes being active in the later stages of wood decay. Now, even though we know this much about brown rot decay, um, it is still necessary to do a little bit more research to see what is actually happening at a cellular level. What is happening or how do these cellulases act at a cell cellular level? For this reason, I'm going to state my goals for my research as follows. I would like to gain a better understanding of cellulase activity during brown rot at the cellular level. And in addition to that, I would like to devise a better way to estimate fungal biomass during the different stages of wood colonization and the different stages of wood decay. Leading up to my hypothesis, I went back in the literature and I reviewed a paper from 91 by Flournoy et al. And Flournoy stated or concluded here that wood pore size is not large enough to allow enzymes to enter the wood cell wall. So this then leads me to question, what if we are following or tracking a specific 
cellulase, uh, specifically an endoglucanase that is secreted by Postia placenum, namely the cell 5B, and see if we follow it through the process of decay, see if we can figure out if it in fact is limited to the lumen of the plant cell wall or if it can in fact enter into the individual layers of the secondary plant cell wall. For my hypothesis then, I am, I am stating cell 5B is able to penetrate into the S2 layer of the plant cell wall. Now, in order to study posterior placenta in the lab, I'm using methodology that was devised by Schilling et al. in 2012. For this, we're using sterile mason jars that have been filled with a layer of sterile soil. So the soil here really acts as a moisture cushion. Posterior placenta does not grow on the soil. We are placing two birch feeder strips horizontally onto the soil and then inoculate these feeder strips with posterior placenta. Um, this creates a fungal lawn on which we'll then uh, prep our wafers, our wood wafers. In this way, we are forcing the fungus to grow up vertically and unidirectionally up along the grain of the wood. So we will keep this setup going for about three weeks, and then we will harvest the wafers. The wafers will look something like this. And um, we will measure out where the hyphal front on top of the wafer, that's where we find the youngest mycelia, are located. We will call our hyphal front our line zero, and from there we will measure down to come up with five areas that we will sample and, uh, and use for downstream analyses. So we will then sample from zero to five millimeters, 15 to 20 millimeters, and 30 to 35 millimeters. This area here uh, being representative of a mid-stage decay, this area here being representative of a later stage decay. Also, this is the exact methodology that was used in uh, Schilling's transcriptome study. Now again, what I'm interested here is, is to find out whether this endoglucanase, which is a type of cellulase from Postia placenta, does in fact cross into the distinct layers of the secondary plant cell wall. Now, one way to track and follow this enzyme through the process of decay is to use an immunolabel. And um, specifically, we are using an immunolabel uh, transmission electron microscopy approach to track our enzyme of interest. Now, the DNA sequence of the endoglucanase cell 5B is known. And in this way, it was possible to use a eukaryotic yeast vector, uh, Pitchia pistoris, um, to transform it, insert uh, the cell 5B sequence, and then overexpress the enzyme. After the enzyme was cleaned up, it was then injected into rabbits to generate a primary antibody to this enzyme. Now, again, in transmission, uh, in transmission electron microscopy, you won't be able to see movement of the enzyme by itself. However, if you label it with a metallic component, you can then actually see it show up on the transmission electron micrograph. For this reason, we created a secondary antibody that would then recognize the primary antibody, which would then follow our enzyme of interest. And what that looks like a little bit, you can see here, so this is the actual immunolabel, or it's also called the immunogold label, as we're using a small 6 to 8 nanometer gold particle that is attached to the secondary antibody. So again, it looks more complicated than it is. Gold particle on the secondary antibody recognizes the primary antibody, recognizes our enzyme of interest, shows up on the TEM. I had some help with the TEM from technicians at PNNL, the Northwest National Laboratory um, in Richland, Washington. This is a really large research campus that you'll find out there, owned by um, US Department of Energy. Many different complexes there. I hope you can see this okay. I worked in this one, EMSL, the Environmental Molecular Sciences Lab. The scientist I worked with is Alice Dolanalkova, and you can see her here in the photo. This was earlier this year in front of her 
uh, TEM setup. So I would prepare samples here on campus in the Schilling lab. I would then um, undergo fixation steps and ship these samples to Richland, to Alice, where she would then plastic embed our samples. And you can see that here. Once our little, these are little wood cubes that are plastic embedded about one by one by one millimeter in size, so very small. The plastic embedded samples would then be trimmed down to size, and you can see Alice doing that here. And then we would um, put our trimmed down sample under the light microscope to double check if we have the accurate orientation of the wood, um, the orientation that we were interested in for further cross-sectioning. Once this has been confirmed, we would then go ahead and do ultra-thin sectioning with a diamond knife on the microtome. And it turned out that sections at uh, 80 nanometer thickness worked really well. These um, plastic embedded wood woody sections would then be placed on little copper grids. You can see me here uh, washing the copper grids, grids in solution, as we are going through um, the immunolabel incubation steps. So finally, when our samples on the copper grids were ready, we would spend many, many hours sitting in the dark on the TEM trying to get a few good images. And next up, I'm going to show you a few preliminary images of my TEM. So starting here, we have just a plant cell wall, no fungus. Um, this is an 80 nanometer section. And to orient uh, you guys here, you can see our middle lamella and the secondary and primary plant cell walls. So the wood here looks good, it is, it is intact. The black lines that you can see here are actually not that important. These are artifacts from the embedding process. So this is where we have little wrinkles in the plastic um, as the samples were cut. But so this is what a wood cell would look like without the fungus. So next up, we are trying to see if the uh, immunolabels that had been generated are actually useful for our study. So up here in the corner, you can see our plant cell wall. And the circular structure here is the fungal hypha from posterior placenta in cross section. And you can see these little black dots that are surrounding the perimeter of the fungal hypha. Let's take a close up look at that. So here you can see lots of little black dots. So again, these little black dots are our gold label, which is present on the secondary antibody, which we are using to track down our enzyme of interest. So Alice would look at this and say here, oh, it's nicely decorated. So that means, you know, in fact, our immunolabel is working really well and we can use it um, to track down the enzyme of interest. So we can say that our labels are working and do in fact have a high specificity. Now in this image, I wanted to show you what uh, wood decay at the later stages of decay from this sample area does in fact look like. So there's no immunolabel here. However, we can see fungal hyphae um, oppressed to the plant cell wall. And in addition to that, you can see that the plant cell walls are quite compromised. We have full thickness tears, it's another close up here, that almost go all the way through the plant cell wall. So at the later stage decay, we can see that the plant cell wall looks pretty beaten up. So for this reason, I have focused a little bit more on sampling and imaging um, or samples at the mid-stage decay, so from the 15 to 20 millimeter uh, area. Now, if you look at the plant cell wall here, it looks a bit more intact. And now in this image, we are using our immunolabel, and you can see our high fine cross section here, and you can see the nicely decorated perimeter of the hypha with our immunolabel. If you take a closer look, you can see here that we have clusters of our immunolabel, in fact, inside the S2 layer, what appears to be the S2 layer of the plant cell wall. So again, these are preliminary images, um, but kind of a neat finding. One more. Okay, so again, um, hypha in cross-section, immunolabel on it. 
if we look at it at a close-up, it appears that clusters of our enzyme of interest are in fact moving into the plant cell wall. Okay, so now moving to my second goal for the brown rod study. I would like to devise a better way to estimate fungal biomass and, um, and do so for each stage of decay or the different stages of brown rod decay that we are looking at. Now I'm questioning here if a, a confocal, excuse me, if confocal laser scanning microscopy could be used to in fact come up with a, an estimate of fungal biomass. And specifically, this leads to my hypothesis stating that if you place a fluorescent signal that is specific to fungal chitin onto our system here, can we quantify fungal hyphae in colonized wood and thereby estimate overall the amount of fungal biomass? Um, in order to create uh, samples that I can use for this biomass estimate, I'm, I'm trying out two types of, section, of sample sectioning. So the first type is uh, cryo, um, using a cryostat, a cryofreezer microtome that you can see over here, and I can generate samples with this up to 60 micrometers in thickness. Also, I've had a trial run where I plastic embedded my woody samples and then used a tabletop rotary microtome with a tungsten carbide blade to cut it at 10 micrometers. Once our sections are produced and put on the glass slides, we will then use a WGA chitin-specific probe, which has a fluorophore attached to it, that is the TMR fluorophore, tetramethyl rhodamine, which is excitable at 532 nanometers. Now, we specifically selected TMR, as we know it is excitable at a wavelength that is distinct from the wavelengths that usually produces autofluorescence in wood when it's put under a confocal microscope. So for, for this reason, we're setting up a, a two-channel confocal to get two clean, distinct signals. Now, the idea is to use the fluorescent signal that is produced from the chitin-specific probe to then calculate the area of the fluorescent signal and use that as a type of biomarker or a type of estimate of our fungal biomass. And to give you a, an idea of what this will look like, preliminary image here. So in red, you can see the fluorescent signal that is emitted from um, the fungus and it is growing through wood. In green, you can see the autofluorescence from the wood. And also these uh, light green lines are indicating, in fact, the way the grain of the wood is growing. So again, we're trying to use software um, that comes with an imaging package called ImageJ um, that we can then use to, to tease these uh, signals apart and calculate, in fact, areas of fluorescence for each of our systems here. So to sum up my efforts for brown rod decay, so again, I would like to localize this endoglucanase, cell-5b, that gets secreted by Postia placenta and see where it will move through or, or where it will go um, in, the, in the plant cell wall. So ideally, I will be able to identify the position of cell 5B within the distinct secondary cell wall layers. Moreover, I would like to use confocal microscopy to quantify fluorescence um, and, and see how that can be used to estimate biomass. Now, confocal microscopy will likely also be useful to identify trends and patterns of the morphology of posterior placenta as it is growing through the different areas of decay. Now, as we are trying to figure out if confocal microscopy and um, the, the quantification through fluorescence, through fluorescence are useful, one way to go about this is to actually look as, at a second biomarker uh, for mm -hmm. fungal biomass. And this could be uh, ergosterol, which we could extract out of our woody wafers um, and then undergo an HPLC with that and do a calculation to see how ergosterol to biomass would look like. And then we could compare these two numbers or quantification of fluorescence 
and our ratio of ergosterol and biomass and see how these results line up. And perhaps we could say that either each one by itself or in combination would be useful measures for fungal biomass in decaying wood. So now switching gears a little bit, moving to the second topic of my research. This, excuse me, focuses on ceratocystis species in rapid ohia death. Specifically, I'm interested in the histopathology of rapid ohia death. So um, rapid ohia death affects a hardwood tree species, the ohia lahua tree, also called Metrosideras polymorpha, that is endemic to the Hawaiian islands. Um, this tree is in the Merle family. The tree makes beautiful red flowers, as you can see in the image over here, and it has uh, a large number of stamens. Um, the flowers attract bees and many other insect species. Um, there are floral nectaries at the base of the flower, which feed many species of birds on the island. Um, this is an important species, a foundation species, that can be seen as an early colonizer of Hawaiian lava flows, as you can see in the middle image here. Now, depending on substrate, Ohia lahua might be growing in like a, a, a shrub-like appearance, as you can see on the image over here, or if the substrate is right, it may um, grow up to 30 meters in height, becomes a really nice looking tree. Now, Ohia Lahua provides many values for the Hawaiian islands and its inhabitants. So as mentioned before, we have um, Ohia Lahua as a foundation species or a keystone species, very important to be the first plant to come in onto the lava flows. It also has an important function in watershed prote protection, and it also provides habitat for many species of insects and birds. As far as economic importance is concerned, I guess we would have to say that uh, Ohia is not a major timber species. However, you can see it used a lot um, on the islands where um, it provides structural support with posts. So a lot of the Hawaiian houses are actually built, raised up, and they sit on ohia poles, either just ohia by themselves, or sometimes you will see that there was a metal rod inserted in the, in the middle of the ohia post. Um, in addition to that, you, you see it in poles and spindles and other specialty wood products. Now, ohia lahua is quite important for Hawaiian culture. Um, hula dancing sticks are made out of ohia wood, also instruments, costumes, and decorations that are used during hula dancing are made from ohia. And finally, there's also a spiritual component um, that can be um, associated with ohia lahua. So in Hawaiian mythology, all Hawaiian trees and forests are considered sacred. Also, there is an interesting story about a love triangle that involves Pele, the volcano goddess, and a guy named Ohia and a girl named Lahua. And it turns out Pele got pretty mad and turned uh, Ohia into a tree and Lahua into a blossom, and things get pretty complicated from there. <laughs> so definitely something <coughs> worthwhile reading. Um, now, rapid ohia death was first observed in 2010. Um, the disease is also called ceratocystis wilt of ohia. Now, this can only, luckily, only be found on the, the big island, um, Hawaii Island, so the southernmost island. If you're looking at disease incidence here, you can see that uh, rod is pretty much all across the big island, uh, except perhaps an area in the north here, center of the island, being primarily um, volcanoes. So the, the disease was first described in 2014. However, at the time, um, the pathogen associated with rod was described to be Ceratocystis fimbriata. In 2015, it was actually determined that it is not one, but two pathogens that are associated 
with rod on the big island. These two pathogens have actually never been described to science. And as of right now, we are calling them Ceratocystis species A and Ceratocystis species B. Taxonomically, you can find these in the Ascomycota and the Microscales. Um, now, both species A and species B can be found phylogenetically in the Ceratocystis fimbriata complex. Interestingly, species A falls within the Latin American clade, while species B falls <coughs> within the Asian clade. Now, to give you uh, an idea of what this might uh, look like in the wild. So for species A, we look at an affected tree here. Um, there isn't much left of it. We can say that this is an aggressive pathogen. It moves really quickly. quickly. Um, it will cause necrosis and decline of the crown of the tree and within weeks or months, we'll call the death of the tree. Similar wilting can be seen with species B. However, it appears that this pathogen or the disease symptoms will um, proceed a little bit slower with species B. If you're looking at cross-section of stems that have been infected with the fungus, you can see that for species A, we have sapwood discoloration. There's a close-up down here. That often gets described as a starburst pattern. For species B, the sapwood staining appears to look a bit different, and often the staining in the sapwood for B is described as more of a smear. Now I have a few more images of ohia trees that are naturally infected. Uh, these samples here were uh, um, collected in the wild, and it turns out that were, they were diseased with species A. And again, you see our starburst pattern in the sapwood here. Um, you see a discoloration of the sapwood and something that appears to be uh, either staining or a canker over here. For naturally infected trees with species B, we see that we have more of a longer and perhaps more narrow looking canker in, in these um, diseased trees. As far as management is concerned, um, in 2015, a uh, sta statewide quarantine was enacted um, that will prohibit movement of a here wood, wood products and plant parts off of the big island. And also soils that are surrounding the affected trees cannot be um, moved around. In addition to the quarantine um, on the island, there's a fair amount of education and outreach work that has taken place. Signs are put up on the trailheads asking hikers to clean their boots um, and, and not move plant parts around. Now, I wanted to summarize what we know and what we don't know about rapid ohia deaths at this time. So again, in 2014, when this was first described, um, uh, very young seedlings and saplings in a greenhouse study were actually analyzed and the pathogen was identified as being Ceratocystis fimbriata. However, since 2015, we know that this is not the case and not only isn't, isn't this just one disease, we are looking at two separate diseases caused by two separate pathogens. So rapid ohia death should rather be understood as a disease complex or a disease syndrome, as there are two pathogens involved here, namely our species A and our species B. Also, we know that in nature, uh, infection involves three spore stages. So we have endoconidia, alurocanidia, and ascospores that are involved with the spread of the disease here. Things that we don't know at this time include the following. So we do kind of know about infection cords. So where is the disease onset? Where does the disease get into the tree? Um, it is believed that tree wounds or openings in the bark are necessary for any of the spore types to get in to then cause disease. However, as far as spore dissemination is concerned, there are a few different hypotheses currently going around. One of these um, comes from Tom Harrington, who is a mycologist at Iowa State University. And Harrington thinks that Alurocanidia are the primary inoculum and that 
we can think about wind as being a, a vector for these allure conidia. Specifically, Harrington believes that as beetles dig through uh, the trees, that allure conidias will co collect in the frass or in the boring dust of these beetles. And as these beetles move the boring dust towards the exit hole, this is where wind would pick up and take the frass and then, or the boring dust and then move spores around. So again, this has not been confirmed at this time. This is a working hypothesis as of right now. Another hypothesis would be that beetles perhaps could act as, an, as a vector and, and uh, vector ascospores. Parathesia have been seen in the wood inside beetle galleries, parathesia being the source of ascospores. Again, just hypotheses. So moving towards my goals for uh, my research, well, first of all, I would like to document patterns of colonization of Ceratocystis A and B in xylem of artificially inoculated Uhia lohua. So right now, we really don't know that much, and we, it would be nice to establish a, a base, some baseline uh, knowledge that we can then uh, focus other research efforts on. And definitely describing colonization patterns is important. It's an important part to begin with. Secondly, I would like to investigate host def defense responses elicited by each fungal species. So working my way up to my hypotheses, I'm asking the question, how does the fungus spread inside the tree host? So what I'm getting at here really is, what type of fungal structure are we looking at? Is it the spread of fungal hyphae or what type of spore is actually um, important to spread the disease within the tree and in between trees. Secondly, I'm asking what type of host defense responses are pres present in infected trees. And this leads to our working hypotheses at the time, species A appears to act more as a wilt pathogen while species B appears to act more as a canker pathogen. Now, next up, my methods to approach this research. Uh, in inoculation or artificial inoculation of mature Ohia trees in the fields are already in progress. And the plan uh, for continuation of this work includes that we will inoculate uh, seven more trees with Ceratocystis A and seven trees with Ceratocystis B, as well as um, two trees that will <coughs> receive sterile water as a mock treatment. These trees will then be felt and sampled after two months, two months after uh, infection and after a longer time period, somewhere between six to 12 months. Now, this is what artificial inoculation trials have looked like so far. So um, we will drill into the sapwood of the mature Ohia trees, you can see that here, then place a piece of filter paper into the opening that is saturated with an endoconidial suspension then replace the wooden disc and um, weatherize the whole tree wound with some plumber, plumber's putty, as you can see here. After our two months and six months time periods, the trees will then be felt, the bark will be stripped off, and the cankers that lie right under the bark will be measured and analyzed. To give you an idea of what a canker would look like, here's a close-up on the left and uh, compare this to what a water mock treatment would look like on the right. Now, when sampling from these cankers, I'm using a sampling scheme um, that was described by Jim Park and Jenny in 2014. And uh, the plan is to sample from five sites along the cankers, namely from each end, as well as three consecutive areas across the canker. And this would look a little bit like this. So once we have our samples from the canker, we will then uh, fix the tissues in solution so we are able to safely take these back to Minnesota with us. And I will follow up the work with microtome thin sectioning, histochemical staining, and light microscopy in addition to further downstream analyses. As I'm thinking about methodology for this work, I have reviewed a few papers 
And I came across this one by Sharon Inch et al. from 2012. And uh, Inch's group used TBO, toluidine blue, to stain and visualize hyphae and spores, but also to see a few of the tree host responses. So both of these um, are, are, are things that I would like to do with my own work as well. Uh, Inch's group also uses SEM to visualize xylem vessel walls, and I think if time allows, including SEM into my work might be a useful component. Also, I'm looking at Gian Park's paper from 2014, which investigates host responses. Gian here focused on lipids, pectins, phenolics, and lignin produced by the tree host. And I think this is definitely something I would also like to do with my rod studies. In summary, so we are going to continue artificial inoculations of mature hea trees on Hawaii Island. In fact, later this month, I'm going to fly out in 10 days. And then we will sample trees in October and likely in January. There's a bit of flexibility there when the second sampling date is taking place. Um, after tissue fixation, we will take our samples back to Minnesota and I will then complete microtome sectioning, microscopy, and downstream analysis here. And ideally, I will be able to describe patterns of colonization as well as uh, distinct host responses. Now, as far as both of my research foci are concerned, I will have to devise some specific and, and customized imaging uh, imaging and, and technical skills to tackle all of my, my research problems. These will include cryosections and microtome sections, customized microscopy that will include light microscopy, confocal microscopy, TEM, and perhaps also SEM, chemical staining, and also um, customized ways to do imaging and image processing, and finally, to complete image analyses. And with that, I'd like to give some thank yous. First off, my advisors, Jenny and Jim Curley, then my committee members, Jonathan and Bob. And I would also thank everybody in the Jesuit lab, everybody in the Schilling lab, um, everybody in the Malvig lab who hosted me for a few months last year. Alice in Richland, Kristen Cooper, librarian extraordinaire, and then people in the department who are ongoingly supportive, namely Lillian, Seth, Fong, Christina, Senna, and Alex. With that, I'd like to take your questions.